Ready to dive into a world where technology and desire collide. I'm in, let's do it. We're tackling Paradisa, a novel that grapples with some seriously meaty questions about love, reality, and the price of pleasure. And we've got some pretty thought-provoking excerpts to unpack today. Yeah, Paradise is one of those books that stays with you long after you finish the last page. It really gets under your skin. What's so fascinating to me is how Louis de Miranda, the author, uses this fictional virtual reality game as a lens to examine our own anxieties about technology. Right. It's like he's holding a mirror up to our digital age and forcing us to confront some uncomfortable truths. It's not just science fiction, it's social commentary. It's like Black Mirror meets The Matrix, but with this uh, uniquely philosophical twist. Totally. And at the heart of it all is Nuno, a young man who's struggling to find meaning and connection in a world that's becoming increasingly seduced by virtual experiences. He's like the everyman of the digital age. It's just so <laughs> relatable. Totally. And that's where Paradisa comes in, right? This incredibly immersive, hyper-realistic virtual reality game. Users create avatars, explore a meticulously crafted virtual world called By Earth. By Earth? Talk about world building, right? Yeah, Dave Miranda really outdid himself with the level of detail. But it's not just about the visuals, right? They can even experience physical sensations through this device called the Sensorium. It's like they've digitized every aspect of the human experience. Pleasure, pain, even love especially love. And that's where things get really interesting, right? Because Paradisa takes it a step further with the introduction of the Pleasurium. Yeah, the Pleasurium. It's almost like they bottled pure pleasure. Like imagine a world where you could bypass all the messy complexities of real life and just plug into guaranteed bliss. Sign me up, right? Who needs the real world when you have that at your fingertips? Hmm. But Dee Miranda doesn't let us off that easy. He uses the Pleasurium to explore this very human tension between seeking pleasure and confronting the... Um, you know, the complexities of reality. It's the ultimate escape. But like any addictive substance, it comes at a cost. And that cost becomes painfully clear with the emergence of the antisocials. Ah, yes, the antisocials. These are the Paradis players who become so consumed by the pleasurium that they lose all interest in the real world, right? Exactly. They become shells of their former selves. Mm. It's a chilling portrayal of how easily we can become enslaved to our desires even if those desires are manufactured. It makes you think, right? Does technology like this ultimately empower us or enslave us? It's the million dollar question of our time, isn't it? It really is. And as we see the seductive power of Paradisa play out, we watch Nuno get sucked deeper and deeper into this digital abyss. Yeah, and this is where his relationship with Clara, his love interest, starts to unravel. Clara is a gifted pianist who represents a more grounded perspective. She sees right through Nuno's obsession with Paradisa. She sees it for what it is. A dangerous escape from the challenges of real intimacy and the messiness of real relationships. It's heartbreaking in a way because Nuno is yearning for connection, but he's looking for it in all the wrong places. He's pushing away a real flesh and blood relationship in favor of this curated virtual existence as his avatar, Orante Magellings. And as if things weren't complicated enough, De Miranda throws another wrench into the works. Oh, right. Angelot Malaner, Nuo's childhood friend and, let's be real, his rival. And the mastermind behind Paradisa, the guy who created this whole digital empire. Imagine the pressure of competing with the very person who created the world you're trying to escape into. It's like she's trapped in Angelot's shadow, both in the real world and in the virtual one. Talk about an inferiority complex waiting to happen. Right. Angelot represents everything Nuno desires success, power, effortless control over this digital domain. And to make matters worse, Paradisa announces this massive in-game event, Love Day. Ah, yes, Love Day, the day that promises to change everything. Okay, for those who haven't read the book, the concept of Love Day is both fascinating and a little bit terrifying. Uh, classic De Miranda, right? Totally. Thousands of Paradisa users will be randomly selected to be subjected to the Amorium. The Amorium, yeah. a technology that claims to trigger feelings of unconditional love. Can you imagine? It's like an experiment gone wild, like an episode of Black Mirror ripped straight from the headlines. Right, and it raises so many questions about the nature of love. Can love be engineered? Can you program genuine emotion? And if so, what does that mean for the future of human connection? It's like the ultimate shortcut. Right. Skip all the messy stuff and go straight to happily ever after. Exactly. But it feels kind of, I don't know. Artificial. Yeah, artificial. Like, is it even real, right? Right. And that's where I think Ludmila Gagarin X comes in. Oh, absolutely. Gagarin X, she's great. 
For those who haven't gotten to her yet. The Maverick scientist? Yes. She's a fascinating counterpoint to everything the Amorium represents. Totally. Because the Amorium is all about manufactured emotions, right? And she's challenging that. A hundred percent. She believes in a deeper connection between love and consciousness. Right, like a spiritual connection almost. She calls it the soulmate theory. Which, when you think about it, completely undermines the whole premise of the Amorium. Oh, totally. And as Nuno's going through all this, grappling with his feelings for Clara, the allure of Paradisa, Gagarinex's ideas start to resonate with him. Because he's starting to see the cracks in this supposedly perfect virtual world. Exactly. And those cracks, they become impossible to ignore with the introduction of the Great Knight. Oh, man. The Great Knight. Talk about a chilling concept. Straight out of a dystopian nightmare. It's designed to purge Paradisa of anyone deemed disruptive. Anyone who doesn't fit in. The ones who aren't buying what they're selling, basically. It's a brutal reminder that even in a virtual world, control still rests with the creators. Big time. And then there's H.I., the hazardous intraterrestrials. Oh, yeah, H.I. Love those guys. These are the rebels, right? Fighting against the system. Digital anarchists determined to expose the flaws in this so-called utopia. And their weapon of choice. Blue lobsters. Blue lobsters. Okay, I'll admit, when I first read about the blue lobsters, I was like, what? It's such a day Miranda thing to do, though. Totally. But the way he weaves it into the narrative, it's genius. It's brilliant. They add this whole other layer of complexity. They're not just a culinary curiosity. They're a symbol. Of the creole. Right. The Creole. Yeah, we should talk about that. It's like a hidden dimension within the game. Where users have these really intense experiences. Heightened states of consciousness, interconnectedness. Users describe it as transformative. It's giving me serious Matrix vibes. Oh, 100%. Are the blue lobsters like the red pill in this scenario? They're a doorway to a different reality, that's for sure. Wow. So you've got the creators trying to maintain control, HI, mm -hmm. trying to blow it all open. And the Creole emerging as this wild card. Where does Nuno fit into all of this? How does he handle this? That's where things get really good. Nuno's journey into the mystery of the Creole and the Blue Lobsters. Yeah. It's a turning point for him. He's starting to realize that real connection, real meaning, you can't just download that. You can't just get that from a pill. Exactly. It has yeah. to be earned through experience, through vulnerability. Through real human interaction, mm. which is Messy and unpredictable. For sure. I feel like something big is about to happen. Oh, definitely. What happens when the, the walls of Paradise start to crumble for real? That's what we're going to talk about next, because yeah. December 21st, 2012 is just around the corner. Okay, things are about to get real. December 21st, 2012, the supposed doomsday predicted by the Mayans. Talk about setting the stage for an epic showdown. What happens in Paradise on this, uh, this highly anticipated, potentially apocalyptic day? Well, imagine this, right? The sun's setting over by Earth Paris, and suddenly something really strange starts to happen. Okay, I'm intrigued. Every building, every car, every inanimate object, yeah. it all starts to transform into this shimmering crystal. The whole city, everything. Everything. It's both beautiful and terrifying at the same time. I bet. So by Earth Paris is completely encased in crystal. What happens to the players? Well, they're trapped, obviously. The city's cut off, isolated. Oh, man. And the great night, that encroaching darkness we talked about, it starts to accelerate. It's like the city itself is being consumed by this uh, this digital apocalypse. And Nuno and Clara, what happens to them in all this chaos? Well, they're struggling, right? I mean, who wouldn't be? But yeah. then Clara, or rather, her avatar, Melodix, remember she works at Victoria's, the cabaret with the mirror drum. I loved that setting. So vivid. Right. So, in the middle of all this, surrounded by shattered illusions and literal shards of crystal, Clara shares this story with Nuno. The land of emptiness and the land of fullness. Exactly. What do you think Demiranda was going for with that story, within a story? It's like this brilliant allegory for the choices we make, both in the virtual world and in real life, right? The land of emptiness represents that seductive trap of instant gratification. The easy way out. But it leaves you, well, empty. And the land of fullness, that's about embracing the full spectrum of human experience. The good and the bad, the joy and the pain. Absolutely. It's hmm. about choosing to really live even when it's hard, even when it hurts. That's a powerful message. 
So as the great night is closing in, Nuno and Clara choose the land of fullness. They choose the creel. They step through that straight. What about the other players, though? Do they make the same choice? That's what I'm wondering. Not everyone's going to react the same way to this kind of pressure cooker situation. What happens to them? It's interesting, right? Because Demerita doesn't present this like black and white, good versus evil kind of thing. It's more nuanced than that. Way more nuanced. Some characters, like Alfred Menhark, the crisis commander, total meltdown. He cracks under pressure. Big time. Others, they just want to escape. They turn to the blue lobsters looking for oblivion and sensory overload. You're just looking for a way out. Exactly. It's a very human response to an impossible situation. What about Angelot? I mean, he created this whole mess. What happens to him? Angelot's journey is probably the most complex out of everyone's. Yeah. Because he's confronted with the consequences of his own creation, right? Yeah, the unintended consequences, all that power. And he couldn't have predicted how it would all turn out. No one could have. But in the end, he makes a choice. What does he do? He lets go. He chooses the Creole, too. Wow. But not as a means of control, you know? More like a surrender to something bigger than himself. It's a humbling moment for him. He realizes that he's not really in control. Not anymore. Exactly. So by Earth Paris, it keeps shrinking down to the size of a small island. And Nuno, Clara, Angelot, the others who chose the Creel, they find themselves standing on the steps of Sacre Coeur. Remember that iconic church? They have this moment, this collective experience, something beyond the confines of the game, even beyond their virtual bodies. Transcendence. It's like they've tapped into something much larger than themselves. So the city is literally disappearing around them, but they've found a different kind of reality. Yeah. And then they make the choice to disconnect, to log off from Paradisa to return to the real world. It makes you wonder though, doesn't it? It really does. Have they been changed by this experience? Can a virtual journey, even one as intense as this one, have real world consequences? That's what De Miranda leaves us with, that open-ended question, no easy answers. Just something to think about. It's a powerful ending though, uh -huh. because it makes us question our, our relationship with technology. Are we using it? Or is yeah. it using us? Are we losing ourselves in these digital worlds? Or are we finding new ways to connect, to grow, to evolve? Right. And what does it even mean to be real anymore? Where do we draw the line between the digital and the, you know, the real world? Especially now, when those lines are getting blurrier every day. It's the question of our time, really. And I think Paradeza does an incredible job of exploring it in a way that's both thought-provoking and deeply unsettling. We've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive. We really have. Yeah. But that's the beauty of Dee Miranda's work. Always leaves you wanting more. So as we unplug from this particular deep dive, what's the one thing you hope our listeners will take away from Paradisa? I think more than anything, Dee Miranda is urging us to examine our own relationship with technology. Are we using it to enhance our lives or are we using it to escape from them? It's a question worth asking ourselves and one that I'm sure will be debated for years to come. That's all the time we have for this episode of The Deep Dive. Thanks for exploring the mind-bending world of Paradisa with us. Until next time, keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep diving deep.